up with new ways to start these things. As this video is a continuation of our chapter 14 notes, um, we've discussed some Mendelian genetics, some of the basics, the terminology, um, Punnett squares, monohybrid and dihybrid Punnett squares, which illustrate the law of segregation and the law of independent assortment, respectively. This one, uh, I don't want to say it's like a potpourri video, but there are some, some things that are talked about at the end of chapter 14, some genetic diseases. Um, so we're going to go through, hopefully, the rest of the notes in this, in this one video. So, feels so spacey. Ooh, yeah, yeah. We'll go ahead and share so I can show you our notes. There we go. I think this is where we left off. So we were talking about co-dominance when both alleles get expressed, incomplete dominance where the, the two traits for the two different genes blend. Well, here's a case, unlike Mendel's traits in his pea plants that he looked at, uh, where there was just, you know, basically one option or the other. It was either purple flowers or white flowers, green seeds or yellow seeds. Some traits are coded for by more than just two genes. And so if we look at blood typing, that's an example. It's also an example of codominance. So the ABO blood typing system, you can be blood type A, B, AB, or O. And you can be homozygous or heterozygous for A, homozygous or heterozygous for B, if you're AB, that means you have an A gene and a B gene. So that's what you are. And if your blood type is O, O is recessive. And so you have to be, have two recessive genes to be blood type O. The way we write the genes or represent the genes for blood type, and I don't know where this came from, honestly, but a capital I with like a super A or a super B, superscripted B to represent the blood type A gene, the blood type B gene. And lowercase i would be the blood type O gene. So if you were little i, little i, you'd be blood type O. If you were I super A, little i, you'd be heterozygous for A. And if you had two I super A's, you'd be homozygous for blood type A. So it's a little weird the way we represent it, but is what it is. And these blood types A and B refer to certain molecules found on the surface of the red blood cells. So if your blood type is A, again, you could be homo or heterozygous, you have these little triangle A molecules on your red blood cells. The blood type is B, again, homozygous or heterozygous, you got these circular B molecules. If your blood type is AB and you have one of each gene, it's codominant. So you're going to get both A and B molecules on all your red blood cells. And if your blood type is O, there's no molecules, no A's and no B's found on the surface of your red blood cells. Now I'll throw this in here, I guess, that the RH factor, RH stands for rhesus monkey, it was discovered in them. It's really just an additional molecule um, so that if you're, let's say, A positive, or RH positive, in addition to the A's, you're gonna have the little RH molecules there as well. Um, if you're B negative, you're just gonna have B's and no RH molecules. If you're O negative, well, that means you've got no A's, no B's, and no RH molecules. So it's just an additional molecule that can be found on the surface of red blood cells. And the fact that if you're O negative and you don't have any of those molecules and you live just fine, kind of indicates that they're not really necessary for anything important. Could just be sort of an evolutionary um, leftover, you know, from some ancestral species that maybe it was important in. Now, as far as bl blood donations go, um, it's your immune system, right, that rejects anything that's foreign. And the way I like to think of it is your immune system is like a blind person reading Braille. You know, the, the immune system is feeling the outside of the cells. And if the cells have your molecules on them, the immune system is, okay, that's one of us, let's it pass. But if it recognizes something foreign on the surface of the cell, oh, sound the alarm. This is not supposed to be in here. It could be here to harm us. Let's kill it. And so you have to think to yourself, what molecules 
is does my immune system is my immune system used to seeing on a day to day basis? So if my blood type is A, my immune system will tolerate blood cells with A molecules on them. So if I put some B blood into my veins, oh, those Bs are far and we better kill these cells. So we'll reject it. Turns out that nothing is acceptable. So if my blood type is A and I put O inside my veins, well, the immune system doesn't feel any molecules on the surface, and so it says that's okay. Same thing with the Rh factor. If I am A positive, and I put, well, let me do it this way. If I'm A negative, and I put A positive blood into me, well, the A molecules are okay, but what are these Rh molecules? I don't, I don't have them. I don't see them. Let's kill these cells. So given that, the universal donor, the blood type that anybody can accept is, you have a guess? O negative. Because that's nothing on top of nothing. Everybody's immune system will accept O negative because there's no A's, there's no B's, there's no RH molecules. Emergency rooms stock a lot of O neg blood because if you're coming in in an emergency situation and they don't have time to do a blood test to see your blood type, they know you can accept uh, quantities of O negative blood. Obviously, they like to try to match it where they can, um, but in an emergency situation, pump them full of O neg. The person or the blood type that can receive any blood, well, that would be the one whose immune system sees all the molecules every day. So what would that be? That would be AB positive. Because if I'm AB positive, my immune system has seen A's, it's seen B's, it sees the RH molecules. So no matter what you put into my system, my immune system will tolerate. So that's, that's the way I always like to think about, you know, blood type questions. Um, think about the recipient who's receiving the blood. What does their immune system see on a day to day? Which molecules? And if you give them anything that has molecules different than that, it's going to be rejected. If you give them O negative, remember your immune system tolerates nothing just fine. Now, one condition or one thing that can happen, um, pregnant moms who are RH negative, um, the first RH positive baby they have sort of primes mom's immune system against the RH factor. And the first pregnancy is usually fine. You know, there's a lot of fluid to fluid contact during delivery, it's the next pregnancy in that RH negative mom, if that second child or third or fourth or whatever is an RH positive baby, uh, it's possible mom's immune system will attack and kill the baby's blood cells and that would kill the, the, the baby. It's a condition known as erythroblastoma, erythroblastoma fatalis, erythroblastosis fatalis. And what they do is, I mean, doctors are well aware of this, and so when you go to the gynecologist, they know what blood type mom is, they know dad's blood type in most cases, uh, and if there's a chance that the baby could be RH positive, they give mom a certain medication to kind of block her immune system from getting primed against that RH factor. All right, a couple terms here. Um, pleiotropy. Pleiotropy is when... Um, one gene has multiple phenotypic effects, pleiotropy. So an example of this might be the melanin gene, right? Where your melanin gene affects hair color, eye color, and skin color. Epistasis is a condition or situation where one gene pair affects the expression of another. And so we'll look at this table of rats, this Punnett square of rats, to make the point. Notice we've got B genes and we've got C genes. So the C genes are going to control the expression of the B genes. Here's what I mean. Black fur is dominant over brown fur. So big B, if you have at least one big B, you're going to have black fur because that's dominant. Every brown rat is little B, little B. It's recessive. But notice the white rats. The white rats are little c, little c. In other words, for the B genes to be expressed, you need at least one dominant C gene. So every rat that has brown or black fur has at least one big C. The little c, little c rats, the B genes don't matter. 
white fern. So here's a case where one gene pair, the C genes, controls the expression of another gene pair, the B genes. That's called epistasis. Polygenic inheritance is kind of the opposite of pleiotropy. Pleiotropy, one gene affects multiple phenotypes. A polygenic trait, multiple genes affect one phenotype. So something like human height. Well, that's not a one gene trait, right? There's dozens and dozens and dozens of genes that together will influence the final height of an individual. So it would be like a polygenic, in fact, the name, right, polygenic, many genes is what it translates to. So there are polygenic traits, and here's an example of that. And so just to make this final point, I actually might cut this off. We'll see how it goes. Um, we talked before about how Mendel made a good choice choosing his pea plant to study heredity. Humans, not good to use. Long generation time, we don't make a lot of offspring. Um, breeding experiments are unacceptable. Like You can't just have people make babies to see what the outcome will be. But we do look at genetics in families, and to do that, we look at a pedigree, a branching diagram where basically uh, males are squares, females are circles. Um, when they're connected, that implies that they have mated and produced children. And of course, here, the daughters are circles, the sons are squares. If the symbol is filled in, that means that that individual has the trait or has the disease that is in question. Sometimes if it's uh, a heterozygous situation or if they're a carrier of a disease, it'll be half filled in. Um, that's not always true. Like here you can see the widow's peak, uh, even the heterozygotes are, are filled in and that's because they have the widow's peak, it's dominant. Something like attached earlobes, which are recessive, you can see the little f, little f's are filled in um, but the carriers of the attached ear lobe gene are not half filled in. Usually that's done when you're a carrier of a disease. So again, we can study pedigrees, track the inheritance of different traits or diseases through families. And in some cases, that'll tell us whether it's dominant recessive, if it's sex linked or autosomal, uh, meaning is it found on the disease gene you know, on the sex chromosome or, or not, because there is a difference with that type of inheritance. Again, we talked about the carry, a carrier of a genetic disease is someone who carries the recessive allele but doesn't have the disease. So be aware of that, that if you are a carrier, you do not have the disease, but you do carry one of the recessive disease genes and can pass it on. Albinism is an example of a recessive condition. Um, if two people that are heterozygous for the uh, albinism, it's actually a melanin gene defect, uh, melanin, like we said, gives your hair, eyes, and, and skin uh, color. And so if that gene is defective and melanin, which is a pigment, isn't produced properly, very, very light hair, very, very pale skin, uh, the eyes sometimes appear reddish because the iris, the colored part of the eye, um, isn't colored. And, and so you kind of see the reflection of the blood vessels from within the eye, and they can take on a reddish appearance. But you can see these parents could have a one in four chance of a normal non-carrier, 50% chance they'll have two non-albino children who are carriers, and there's a one in four chance that the child will have albinism. Um, consanguineous matings, that's inbreeding. Um, you know, one, one thing to make a point of is if, and again, I'm just, if, if, you know, you marry your cousin or you have babies with your cousin, Yes, from a society standpoint, that's frowned upon, right? We don't, we don't condone incestual relationships. But it's not like if a brother and a sister had a kid together, that that child would automatically be born with like two heads or, or you know, 15 toes or something. It's not the way it works. The reason that consanguineous or, or inbreeding uh, is, is genetically bad 
is because the likelihood that those two individuals will carry the same mutated genes is higher, right? If they're related, they're more genetically similar. So that's the, that's the problem with uh, consanguineous matings is that they're more genetically similar and they're likely to have the same uh, either disease genes or, or mutated genes for you know, development or, or what have you. Cystic fibrosis, CF. Um, I think I'm going to, bear with me a second. Yeah, I'm gonna keep going. CF is a recessive disease where there is a defective chloride ion channel. And so normally these ion channels allow ions to diffuse. Uh, and remember, water follows. Water diffuses toward the hypertonic area. And so because your chloride ions don't diffuse properly, um, the end result is that you get thick mucus buildup in your airways and in your digestive tract. So people with CF um, used to not live really in much past their teens. And now people can live full lifespans, basically, with, with medications and, and so forth that we have to break up that thick mucus. Um, sickle cell anemia is, again, a recessive condition where there is a bit of incomplete dominance. Um, th this is a hemoglobin gene defect. So instead of the hemoglobin folding up real nice inside the red blood cell, I have a picture. Show you a picture in class. Um, the red blood cell with the hemoglobin, the, the mutated hemoglobin, the hemoglobin sticks out in straight rod type shapes and it makes the red blood cells take on a half moon or sickle shape. These red blood cells don't live very long in circulation. They don't carry oxygen very well. And so if you are homozygous for sickle cell, you have two bad hemoglobin genes, that can be fatal. Um, you can imagine if all your red blood cells were like that, you're going to have a real rough time, you need transfusions and so forth, maybe even a bone marrow transplant um, so that you can make some, some good red blood cells. If you're heterozygous for sickle cell, they call that sickle cell trait. So homozygous for it, yeah, you can, you can live, but you're going to have lots of issues. Um, your capillaries get clogged up. They call them having crises. You know, you'll be in the hospital quite a bit. Heterozygous for sickle cell, you have sickle cell trait. So, you know, like I said, it's a little bit incomplete, or excuse me, a little bit co-dominance. So I said incomplete before. Co-dominance where you've got some normal red blood cells, but some sickle-shaped ones. And so you're going to have less issues, but you're still going to have problems. And of course, if you have two normal hemoglobin genes, then you've got normal red blood cells. Again, not all disorders are recessive. There are some dominant ones. Achondroplasia is a form of dwarfism. And some dude right there. And you can see that if two people um, have a baby where one is a dwarf with one dominant disease gene, it's, it's much more rare to have two dominant disease genes, but it could happen. Um, this mates with uh, someone who's not a dwarf, you can see there's a 50-50 shot that they're going to have a kid with uh, this type of dwarfism. Huntington's disease is another dominant disease gene. Now, this one's a little scary. Um, there's, a, there's an abnormal protein called Huntington or Huntington uh, that builds up specifically in nerve cells and nerve cells of the brain. It's progressive where you lose function more and more over uh, years, typically. Um, you have these rhythmic, repetitive movements that develop. Um, it's thought that, you know, in... in human history, uh, individuals that were thought to be possessed by spirits maybe had Huntington's disease, and that's why they moved so uncontrollably. And the scary part is, this typically doesn't show up in, until you're in your 30s, 40s, even 50s. And it's a dominant disease gene, which means you've probably had your kids already, which means there's a 50-50 chance that each of those kids might have Huntington's disease. It's a horrible neurodegenerative disease. Um, and unfortunately, you could pass it on without even knowing uh, that you had it, let alone that you could pass it on to your children. All right, just so to wrap up, um, two genetic testing procedures. One is amniocentesis, and one is chorionic villus sampling. Um, and amnio is done by inserting a needle 
into the placenta and drawing out some amniotic fluid, which has some baby cells floating around it. And we could take those baby cells, we could do a karyotype, we can do different genetic testing. A CVS test, uh, you actually take a little chunk of the placenta. And believe it or not, the placenta is made of baby cells, not mom cells. A lot of people think it's, you know, mom builds the placenta around the baby, but not so. So taking a chunk of the placenta gives you baby cells. And remember, every cell is genetically identical because they went through mitosis from the zygote. Amnio an amniocentesis um, is less invasive because you're just sucking some fluid out. Got to be careful not to poke the baby. But you have to wait longer to do it, so enough fluid, uh, fluid builds up. So it's less invasive, but you have to wait longer. With a CVS, it's a little more risky. You take a chunk of that placenta, you might induce some hemorrhaging. You could induce even premature labor, but you could do it earlier. And so if you're very concerned about finding out if a baby has a, a certain genetic disease or chromosomal condition, you know, you would do a CBS, you would take the risk to find out sooner versus an amnio, which is not as invasive, but you have to wait longer. All right, a nice summarizing diagram, right? Complete dominance, incomplete co-dominance. Talked about multiple alleles in the case of blood typing, pleiotropy, epistasis, polygenic inheritance, all that good stuff. All right, so this wasn't too bad. It's maybe a few minutes longer than I had hoped, but not so bad. Hey, guys, again, if you have any questions about any of this, please email me, book some time, ask in class, and I will see you next time.